Well, we want to welcome everyone um, this evening, and uh, thank you for joining. Uh, we're looking for the Lord to give our brother Marius help this evening as he shares a word of ministry with us. So if you're here for the first time, we give you a warm welcome here in cold New Zealand. <laughs> cold New Zealand. Um, and we especially welcome those of you before. We have a brother, Winton Granger, from South Africa. And then down in Hastings, there's a, a whole group of believers who looks like Maori's Lounge. So we welcome everyone down there. Um, and uh, pray the Lord's blessing. So I'm going to mute one and um, sing an opening hymn, after which I wonder if uh, uh, Norman will open up the for us. Brother Norman, is that okay? Yeah, that's good. Thanks. So we'll mute everyone and then we'll be opening him after which brother Norman will open in prayer. Thank you. Um, Norman, we'll just unmute you. There we go. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just give thanks that uh, you've called us all together around the world. And as we come into your holy presence, we are amazed that we can come together. Even though we're apart in distance, we can come together in the work of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, as we hear from your word tonight, we just ask that we be blessed, we be challenged, we be encouraged as we um, look at your word. And Father, we want to thank you that we belong to one family, the family through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And we do look forward to the day when Jesus returns and uh, claims us all as his own and takes us to the glorious place that he's preparing now, our heavenly home. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for such great love for us and uh, what you've provided for us and the help that you've given to us during this time. 
and as the uh, world struggles with uh, dealing with this uh, pandemic, uh, Lord, we just ask a blessing on the church as they share the goodness of God's grace. And Lord, may we be encouraged to share with the joy and hope that we have been given through knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. Today, we want to thank you that we can join with fellow Christians throughout the world and celebrate that we have a wonderful Saviour and we have the access to the living Word of God. And we thank you in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Norman. We'll hand the meeting now over to Brother Marius. Thank you, Marius. And it's good to be with you again on such a cold evening. Would you please turn with me to the book of the Psalms, Psalm number three. Psalm number three, the third Psalm. Reading from verse one, Lord, how are the increase that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many they be, which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God, Selah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, or a shield about me. My glory and the lifter up of my head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, Selah. I laid me down and slept. I await, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Selah. And we trust the Lord to bless the word that we've read together tonight. Considering the global situation with COVID-19, its rapid spread, its lack of respect for age, status, or location, the lack of a vaccine, Two questions that come to mind are, why do we have suffering in this world? And why do we suffer as believers? Why do we have suffering in this world? And why do we suffer as believers? If any of these questions have ever crossed your mind, then Psalm 3 is just the Psalm for you. It was written by David, at a time when his whole life had been turned upside down, just like our world had been turned upside down by this virus. Psalm 3 is a psalm that was born out of suffering. In this psalm, we get a glimpse into David's life to see how he handled a particular incident or a particular season of sufferings. Psalm 3 teaches us something about trust and faith in God, especially in the face of great suffering. Here we see the peace and calmness of David's spirit. When he suffered at the hands of man, at the hands of his friends, of his own son, it was only the Lord who could give him such tremendous peace. Isn't it a great mercy? That when we are in trouble, to have our minds stayed upon God. And looking at the psalm tonight, my intention is to explore the psalm by using three scientific instruments to examine the details, some of the details of the psalm. I'd like to start by taking a telescope to look at the psalm itself. And then we will take a microscope to look at the psalmist. And finally, we will take a stethoscope to look at the salas. So the three things we want to consider tonight are the psalm, the psalmist, the salas. 
First thing, the psalm. The telescope will help us to look at the big picture. Where does Psalm 3 fit into the Old Testament? Where does it fit into the book of the Psalms? The telescope will therefore help us to widen our focus. And if we look at this big picture, you'll find that the Old Testament is divided into three very broad groups. You have in the beginning of the Old Testament, the historical section, Genesis to Esther. And then at the end of the Old Testament, you have the prophetical section, the major and the minor prophets, 17 historical books, 17 prophetical books. And right in the middle, you have in the heart of the Old, Old Testament, you have the book of the Psalms, the poetical books, Job, the Song of Solomon. So Psalm is, Psalms is really at the heart of the Old Testament. And when we think of the heart, we think of the emotions, we think of the feelings, and that's exactly what we get in the Psalms. The emotions of those men of God and the feelings, even those of Christ himself. Not only do we find the book of the Psalms in the middle of the Old Testament, it is also its highest point. Have you ever climbed to the highest point of the hill where you are able to enjoy a 360 degree view of the landscape. You can look back, you can look ahead, you can look up, you can look down. Maybe you and I are not fit enough to climb a little hill. Well, you've reached a spiritual hill when you come to the Psalms. The Psalms reach out in all directions. It looks back at history. It looks forward to Israel's glorious future and ultimate prophetical fulfillment in Christ. It looks up to God for protection and guidance, and it looks down to get heaven's perspective on earth. It looks inwards to discover our own weakness and frailty, and it gives strength as it ministers to our needs. The messages of Psalms apply to real life situations, to our current circumstances, for every generation. My dear brother and sister, whatever you're going through, remember, these men had been there before us. They've had dealings with God and they've much to teach us. And these lessons are timeless. The book of the Psalms is the longest book in the Bible. It is really divided into five books. It's a collection of five books. The first book of the Psalm Psalm 1 to 41, book 2, Psalm 42 to 72, etc. Each book ends with a doxology, a song of praise. So that book 1, Psalm 41, ends with Amen and Amen. And book 2 in Psalm 72 ends with Amen and Amen. And book 3 in Psalm 89 ends with Amen and Amen. Book four concludes with Praise ye the Lord. And book five, Psalm 150, also concludes with Praise ye the Lord. Keeping these divisions in mind, there seems to be a link between the five books of the Psalms and the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch. Looking at book one, the Genesis book of the Psalm, Psalm, 40, Psalm 1 to 41. It corresponds with Genesis. And the book of Genesis, you and I know, are concerned with, is concerned with the beginnings of everything. Psalm 3 then, falling within the first book of the Psalms, corresponds with Genesis. We can therefore expect an overall emphasis on beginnings or first things. Psalm 3 has a number of notable first things to its credit. In it, we find the first rebellion. A rebellion recorded within a family against a fellow human being. Remember how Genesis starts? Genesis 3 starts with rebellion, rebellion against God, against deity. And the very next chapter, chapter 4, rebellion against a brother. 
Some start the same, the first book. Psalm 2 records rebellion against deity, against the anointed of God. And the very next Psalm, Psalm 3, David's son, Absalom, rebelled against his father. The situation became so grave that David actually left the walled fortress of Jerusalem and he fled. He ran away. The king didn't know who was with him and who was against him. David would, didn't know who would come to his side and who would side with the enemy. You will find that the one word that can summarize, summarize Psalm 3 is suffering. Not only do we have the first rebellion, we also have the first occurrence of the word Salah. Although Psalm number three is usually divided into four divisions, I prefer to use the occurrences of Salah to divide the Psalm into three divisions. In the first part, David counts his enemies and David fled. It led to his first Salah in verse two. Then the second part of the Psalm, David demonstrates great faith under the most trying of circumstances. That led to his second Salah in verse 4. And in the third part of the psalm, the third part beautifully expresses an absolute peace and calm in the midst of the greatest of danger. It led to the last Salah in verse 8. But more about the Salahs later. Again, I want you to note the word that I've used to summarize psalm number 3 is the word suffering another first this is the first psalm with a historical title it says when he fled from absalom his son there were many crises in david's life but this was one of david's most testing and trying times his son wanted him dead his trusted counselor a hyperfocal turned against him. The nation's young men turned, to get turned against him. All Israel turned against him. What circumstances for the king? What suffering? These are the kind of salahs that God sometimes allow in our lives. It might, not, it might come in the form of a sickness, of personal problems, of difficult circumstances, endemics, pandemics. The word that summarizes Psalm 3 is suffering. This is the first psalm that is actually called a psalm. In its original form, the word psalm has the idea of pruning. It has behind it the idea of pain. It is very obvious that David was being pruned. He was being tested. He was being tried. You know, if, if one wants to impress others, he'd use big words, long sentences, complicated sentences but when someone suffers not much time is wait, wasted with unnecessary words and complicated words and phrases and this is exactly the feature of psalm number three the sentences are short the words are simple it's right and straight to the point you see problems and circumstances always have the effect of pruning away all pretense and boasting it's a process that helps or that rids us of many a hindrance in our spiritual life. The word that summarizes Psalm 3 is suffering. This was also the first morning psalm. It was written after a night of crisis, of danger, of suffering. You see, part, Psalm number 3 is a part of a little group of psalms. Psalm 3, 4, and 5. Psalm number three is a morning psalm. Psalm four is an evening psalm. Psalm five is a morning psalm again. Mornings and evenings were some of the most important times for the Jew with regards to sacrifice and worship. The Levite would stand in the morning and his eyes would be fixed on the horizon to see the sun rising. That will indicate the start of the morning sacrifice. But when Goliath challenged the, the armies of Israel 
They did that in the morning. And Israel's armies, their eyes were on the giant, on the problem, on the difficulty, instead of being on the sun to start the morning devotions. At the time when their minds and their thoughts and the devotions were to be occupied with the rising sun, they were focused on a Goliath. But unlike them, when we worship, our eyes are fixed, not on the rising sun, but on the sun at the right hand of the majesty on high. My brother and sister, what about your worship times? What about your quiet times? What do you allow it? What do you allow to disrupt it? Considering this big picture of the psalm, just like Genesis, Psalm 3 highlights beginnings or first things in the book of the Psalms. And therefore it begs the question, what are the first first things in my life, in your life? What would be the things you'd consider most important? Things of first priority. The patriarchs in Genesis, they had a habit of putting God first. Life with God began when you and I were saved. But have we continued to put him first in everything? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. The psalm. Let's move on and look at the psalmist. The telescope helped us to widen our focus. But now, looking at the psalmist, we will apply the microscope. Not now to widen the focus, but to narrow the focus and look at the details of the psalm and exposition of the text. If I was to summarize Psalm 3 in one word, again, it would be suffering. This psalm is really about suffering in the life of the believer. And suffering is a strong current running through this whole psalm. You will find, and it will be your experience as well, that suffering is part and parcel of the Christian pathway. Suffering affects every one of us. So the important thing is not to try and identify whether or not we experience suffering, but rather to determine how we handle it when it comes. As we put David, the psalmist, under the microscope, I'd like you to observe an interesting development in his experience with God. I want you to observe in verse 1 to 2, David's fear. David was afraid. David's fear. And then in verse 3 to 4, David's faith. And lastly, in verse 5 to 8, David's fearlessness. David's fear, his faith, and his fearlessness. Let's look at verses 1 to 2. David's fear. Psalm 3 sums, sums up the events that took place in 2 Samuel 15 to 18. What happened there? David, some Absalom, rebelled against his father. He gathered together a great number of the disaffected, disaffected in the kingdom, and he proclaimed himself king over the people. David's first response was to flee, to run away. He fled Jerusalem as not only his throne, but his very life was in danger. Life for David was falling apart. And you'll see that in verse 1. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? David's cry echoed the very words of 2 Samuel 15 and 12. It says, the conspiracy was strong. For the people increased continually with Absalom. Here David says, how are they increased that trouble me? David's enemies were increasing in number and the ranks were growing daily. Notice the size of the, of the rebellion, the strength of the rebellion. It says in verse 1, how are they increased that trouble me? It carries on, many are they that rise up against me. Verse 2, many there be which say of my soul and so on. Let's identify the people. David wrote about in Psalm 3. It's recorded for us in 2 Samuel 15 to 16. First of all, there was Absalom, his son, rebelled against him. And then there were the young men who rebelled, and the people went after Absalom. 
the men of Israel all supported Absalom. But most importantly, Ahithophel, David's trusted counselor, betrayed him. And Ahithophel greatly strengthened Absalom's cause. He was the main reason why so many turned from David and rebelled against him. Why was that? You see, the people trusted Ahithophel. If you come to the Old Testament, you read of this man in 2 Samuel 16 and 23. The counsel of Ahithophel was as if a man had inquired at the oracles of God. What a man! You're not surprised that the people trusted him. The question remains, why did Ahithophel turn against David? You see, this man was the grandfather of Bathsheba. David actually wronged his granddaughter, and David killed his grandson by marriage. This for Ahithophel was an opportunity for revenge. And when the opportunity presented itself, he betrayed David. But after the rebellion failed, he hanged himself. It is Psalm 41 that used this very incident to point to the Lord's experience many, many years later. When one of his own Judas Iscariot betrayed him and eventually hanged himself. David feared the situation. And his first response was to run. But that led to his first salah in verse 2. What did that mean for David? How did the salah affect him? Well, for starters, he stopped. That's one of the meanings of salah. He stopped and he started to think about his situation. But he also thought about God. And that resulted in the faith he exercised in verses 3 to 4. So, verse 3 to 4, David's faith. Probable problems and difficulties usually cause one of two reactions. Flight or faith. Some people run from God and others run to God. See, David ran away from the problem, but he was running to God. My brother and sister, where do you run to when you suffer? Do you run away from God or do you run to God? David ran to God in faith. And in verse 3 to 4, David's faith, David's faith is now put under the microscope. So let's examine it and see how David fared when his faith is put under the microscope. Verse 3 and 4, he recognized that the only one who could protect him from his enemies was God. It was in that moment, while he was still under attack, that David poured out his soul to God. And he concludes with a tremendous statement in verse 4. And he heard me. This for me is one of the highest points in this psalm. As it changed David's perspective. It changed David's state of mind. When we are only occupied with the enemy and looking at the enemy. The enemy will grow in the mind's eye to enormous proportions. That's what happened to David in verse 1. He says, how are they increased? How are they growing that trouble me? However, David got a salah. David stopped looking at the enemy. He stopped counting the surrounding enemies. And he started to look up to God. And as he moved his eye from from the enemy to God, the mood of the psalm changes. In our deepest need, we have the power to choose the object of our focus. It's either the enemy or the outstretched hand of the Almighty God. You and I can't stop trouble. We can't prevent it. We cannot diminish its frequency. But what we can control is how we react. But how do we learn to turn to God if our tendency is to run away from him? It boils down to one thing. We need to get to know 
the God of heaven. David's assurance came from a deep relationship and a very deep knowledge of his God. His faith that he exercised was based on what he knew was true of the person and the character of God. What do you know about God's character? What did David know about God's character? He tells us something about God's character in verse 3. He speaks of the Lord in three ways. He says, Jehovah is my shield, and Jehovah is my glory, and Jehovah, Jehovah is the lifter up of my head. He says in verse 3, my shield, thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. That word shield is not the ordinary word for shield. It is the word buckle. A completely surround, a complete surrounding protection. Jehovah completely surrounded him with his peace, with his presence, with his protection, with his care. He was wrapping him around. This was no partial defense. This was no temporary defense. No, Jehovah was surrounding him on every side with his presence. Thou art a shield to me. This protection was based on the promises of God. David knew this God and the promises of God. Remember in Genesis 15 verse 1, God spoke with Abram and he promised to be a shield to the individual, Abram. In Deuteronomy chapter 33, God is promising to be a shield to the nation. Those promises, my dear brother and sister, still apply today. He is still our shield individually and collectively. We can enjoy both the promise um, of, his, of his presence and his protection. We can therefore declare with confidence, if God be for us, who can be against us? Do you know God is a shield? David says, he is my shield, but he says, he's also my glory. David was robbed of just that, of his glory. But he recognized here that his glory was not dependent upon what man did to him. It came from God himself, and therefore his glory was perfectly safe. My brother and sister, you can leave things like your reputation and your character in God's hands. Don't worry if you are falsely accused or misunderstood. God has safeguarded your best interests perfectly. He is your glory. But then David says, he is the lifter of my head. Of my head. David left Zion weeping. His head was, was covered. He had a bowed head. And, 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 and that was evidence of David's bleak circumstances. For him, there was no upward look. And many of us are going through great suffering and we feel defeated and we, come, we feel we've come to an end of ourselves. Many dear saints of God are unable to see beyond earthly suffering. The burden is so great and there seems to be no light at the end of the tunnel. But he is the lifter up of the head. That is a Hebrew expression meaning to be restored to dignity and, and to position. Remember Joseph told the chief butler in Genesis 40, within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head. And in verse 20, Pharaoh lifted up the head of the chief butler. He was restored to his previous position. In exercising faith, David knew that the sun will rise again and he will eventually return to the place of his, to his palace, to his throne, to his glory, to his people with his head lifted high the lord is the lifter up of our heads david's faith triumphed over his fear he says in verse 4 i cried unto the lord with my voice and he heard me out of his holy hill in verse 2 many have concluded there is no help for him for him in god david knew better he says in verse 4 he heard me David praised God for answered prayer while he was still in the midst of danger. And the tenses that are, that are being used here indicate that he was, it was his habit to turn to God whenever he was in need. This was not a one-off turning to God. This was a constant turning to Jehovah. He was often in the dark. 
but his feet were so accustomed to that road to God that he had no problem finding God in the dark. Are you accustomed to the road? Do you know the road to God well enough that you'll find him even in the dark? How did David know that God heard him? How do we know that God hears us? How can we be sure? Only by faith. What does it mean? It means that we take God at his word. We don't doubt his goodness and his grace and, and his greatness. David had a passion for the word of God. And in it, he learned something about God's character. And therefore, he was convinced that God heard him. What do we know about the character of God? With the strong current of suffering throughout the psalm, David chose that which take him and pushed him above that current. Faith. David now has no fear. And in verse 5 to 8, we note this definite change. From fear, verse 2 to 3, then faith, verse 5 to 8, David's fearlessness. Verse 5, while the enemies were still around him, he says, I laid me down and slept. How many of us would have a good night's sleep under those circumstances? That's exactly what David did. He slept. No fear. Verse 4 ended with a salah. It allowed David to stop and to think and consider again. He probably thought of the lion and of the bear and of Goliath and of King Saul. They could never touch him. God was the one who gave him that victory. God was his help. God was his protection. He knew he had nothing to worry about. So he says, I laid me down and slept. A man who enjoyed perfect peace of God. While the danger was still current and the threat was current. In verse 6, his mighty men, his faithful men, they were ready to defend the king with their lives. They got themselves ready for a possible attack. They were all on the edge with no thought of resting. They looked at the king expecting him to be fearful. David was relaxed, at rest. David was writing. There's a proverbial phrase which says, when life gives you a lemon, make lemonade. What did David do when his life fell apart? David wrote a psalm. He wrote Psalm 3. What was he writing? In his writing, he expressed an absolute fearlessness. He says, I will not be afraid. Fearlessness. I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people that have set themselves against me, against me round about. In order to reach David, they had to break through the all surrounding shield of Jehovah. With a God like that, there's no need to fear. And with David, the believer can rest and sleep in the midst of the greatest of danger. You see, earlier, those numbers, with the very reason why he feared. Now that very number is the reason for praise because they have to fight a greater force, the tremendous power of Almighty God, His God and our God, His defense and our defense. And so David excl exclaimed, finally in verse 8, salvation belongeth unto the Lord. We don't have the time to spend too much time in verse 8. But I want to ask you a question. If your life was to be put under the microscope and your response to suffering was examined, what will it be? What will be seen? Trust, confidence, faith, fearlessness? Or will it be worries, anxiety, and fear? The psalmist. That brings me to the last part of my message. We've looked at the psalm. We've looked at the psalmist, and now let's look at the salas. The telescope helped us to widen our focus. The microscope helped us to narrow the focus. Now by using the stethoscope, it will help us to deepen our focus, to look at things that cannot be seen with a naked eye, to see what is beneath the surface. surface. Let's put the stethoscope to the page of scripture and listen to David's heartbeat. 
under such tremendous suffering, you'd expect a very agitated heartbeat, an irregular heartbeat, an increased heart rate. But in listening to David's heart, you'll find it beating at a normal rate. It is calm, it is regular, it is undisturbed. The stethoscope will reveal David's secret. And that secret is found in this little word, Selah. Psalm 3 introduces us to this little word, and it keeps on appearing throughout the entire book. It is a most common word, but it's used only in two books in the Bible. It occurs 71 times in the book of the Psalms and three times in the prophecy of Habakkuk. And it's in Habakkuk chapter 3, which is a psalm. Habakkuk wrote a psalm. It was mostly used by men under suffering, men who experienced difficult situations. The word salah is part of the Hebrew musical terminology. Psalms was Israel's hymn book. Psalms that was written to the chief physician contains this little word, salah. The prophet Habakkuk in his psalm indicates the instrument to be used. He said it needs to be played on the strings. And if you're going to express deep emotions through music, the strings will be used. He also indicates the tune. It was to be sung on the tune of Sigurnoff. The idea behind this tune is that of an emotional plea during troubled and difficult times. The word salah has a variety of meanings, all of which are somehow related. There are at least three meanings. Firstly, it signifies a stop, a silence, a pause, a break. It's a direction to the singers to stop the singing. David had been stopped three times in the psalm, and every time something positive came from it. A second meaning of salah is that, a, in fact, it's the original meaning, to lift up. That's a direction now, not to the singers, but to the instrumentalists. While the singers stopped singing, it required and allowed the instrumentalists to continue playing, to lift up their voices, to lift up their sounds. The accompaniment, accompaniment provided by the instruments are, is usually secondary to the melody. But this was the chance to be heard. This was the chance to be on display. The singers stopped singing to reflect on what had been said and been sung. While the instruments lifted up their voices, the singers lifted up their hearts and serious contemplation. A third meaning of salah. It comes from the Hebrew root, a root word which means to hang. In other words, to measure as in weighing something in the balances. When something was weighed by hanging it on a type of balance, a measuring scale, it was to determine its value and its worth. The salah implies that they were to measure and to value carefully what had been said, what had been sung. My dear brother and sister, what happened in the music and what happened in Psalm 3 and in the Psalms also happens in our lives. Sometimes we experience personal salahs. When we are silenced, Brought to a stop, as it were, through circumstances, David was made to pause, to stop. He was given a salah several times during his life. Through suffering and difficult circumstances, he was stopped in his tracks. Why? To focus on God. God sometimes uses pain and suffering to stop us in our tracks, as it were, in order to focus our attention on himself. This experience of Psalm 3 was one of the salahs that God allowed in his life. Have you had a, a salah lately? Are you in the midst of a salah? You're not singing, but given a time to be quiet. The word salah poses three very important questions. 
the first question is why is this suffering in the in the world suffering causes the world to question the very existence of god they say if god is such a good god and such a loving god why does he allow all the suffering why doesn't he do something about it there are three historical events that help explain the existence of suffering in the world the foundations the fall and the flood by the foundations i mean the creation god set up this world with natural laws regulating things as gravity and weather patterns and, and ocean tides etc it is there for man's good and if violated they bring consequences we can cook with fire or we can be consumed with it gravity keeps us attached to to planet earth but it can also crash to the ground if a plane engine fails if these laws are violated suffering is the natural outcome so who is behind suffering but god another historical event that helped explain the existence of suffering in the world is the fall why didn't god create a world free of natural disasters free of pandemics and viruses he did eden was a paradise of beauty and tranquility with no sickness no diseases no viruses no nothing but man sin and everything changed sin introduced death spiritual and physical death and death and suffering entered man's vocabulary who was really behind suffering then the flood peter contrasted today's world with the world that then was the flood changed the world the earth's topography and geology and clim climatology and some scientists claim that there were no natural disasters before the flood so who's really behind suffering not god it's man and his choices the second question that the words allow us is why does god allow his own to suffer why do believers suffer you see suffering is a reality for both believers and unbelievers but in the midst of suffering we can trust god a well-known theologian was asked the question what is the greatest weakness among christians today his answer they have an inadequate view of suffering and that is true of believers everywhere it's not always god's will for believers to be healthy and wealthy but instead of submitting to god some grow bitter and some will complain and say why me why don't i have a right to happiness why do i have to suffer where was god when i needed him they all share in common an inadequate view of suffering we ask the question why does god allow his own people to suffer the real question my brother and sister is what do we know about suffering it's of paramount importance that we understand suffering from god's perspective and adjust our attitudes accordingly paul tells us that to suffer for christ is a gift philippians 1 and 29 for unto you it is given it is a gift in behalf of christ not only to believe on him but also to suffer for his sake james says suffering is a joy count it all joy peter says suffering is a gracious thing it is a thankworthy thing you see you and i can respond to suffering like an egg or a potato a, an egg goes into the boiling water soft and it comes out hard bitter as it were a potato goes in hard and it comes out soft it can be molded and broken up and mashed without losing any of its substance and still be useful to others how am i responding to this alas that god has sovereignly allowed in my life am i submitting or resisting him if we submit he will soften our hearts and give us both the courage and the strength we need in suffering so let us thank god for the gift of suffering for the joy of suffering and for the grace of suffering the last question that the word salah asks is 
why should we accept the salahs that God has allowed in our lives? I can think of at least three reasons. Salahs teaches us something about the composer. It teaches us something about compassion. And it teaches us something about counting time. First of all, it teaches us something about the composer. Who determines where to put the salahs? It's placed there by the composer. And our heavenly composer knows when and where to put my salahs and your salahs. Composers since the earliest of times realized the importance and the effect and the beauty of pauses and rests in music. If given a sickbed and trying times and testing times, who decides when and why? It is our composer. He knows the why. He knows the when. He knows the how long. Salah, just like pauses in music, it contributes to the perfection of the music. It's part of the music. Throughout the process, God is molding us. God is improving our lives. He's improving our relationship with him. He knows where and when to write salahs. Some think of music only in terms of sound, but rests and pauses and silences can be as effective as a full chord. It teaches us something about a composer, but it also teaches us something about compassion. It enables us to open our ears and listen to God and listen to others. When singers are given a salah, instead of focusing on their own voice, on their own song, they could now reflect and listen and on, on, to, to the words that they've sung. They can appreciate others and also the word of God. When brought to a standstill through suffering, we are more likely to listen to others. There's an American composer, John Cage. He's written a comp composition, a song, and he calls it 433. He went to sit at the piano for the first performance, and he sat there for four minutes and 33 seconds without touching the piano. Absolute silence. He was trying to force his audience to listen to other sounds inside and outside the auditorium. It's only then that some people could pick up somebody coughing. Somebody sighing. Sometimes we need to be stopped to listen, to appreciate more the advice, the words, the contributions, the situation of others, but more importantly, the word. May we come to appreciate, be still, and know that I'm God. It teaches us something about the composer. It teaches us something about compassion. And lastly, Salah teaches us something about counting the time. In the modern orchestra, there's about, it can be up to 100 musicians. But they really play together all of the time. Most of the time, one or some or even groups of instruments are not required to play based on the composition and the wishes of the composer. However, this is not the time to relax. This is not the time to play a game, to, to chat, or to send a text, or to, or to take a selfie. While silent, they, needed to be, they need to be highly attentive and focused. They expect it to count the time. They have to follow the music. They have to listen to others, and they have to watch the conductor to again join the group at the right time. They are silenced for a while, but they are always in harmony with the rest. My brother and sister, have you been silenced? You're still part of the group. Quiet times and silent times of, for the believer as never isolated times. We need each other. We need each other prayers and each other support. The one who's being silenced in the orchestra, he is expected to count the time to be ready when the conductor indicates the right moment to start contributing. If his eyes are not on the leader, he may start too soon or too late. Either way, he will create confusion and chaos and problems, not only for himself, 
but for others as well. Have you been given a salah lately? Are you in the midst of a salah? Are you ready for active, to be active again, to serve, to contribute again? Can I ask you the question, where's your focus? Is your focus on other believers, on the problem, on yourself, on your suffering? We will never be ready unless we look up and we focus on our heavenly conductor. Only those occupied with the leader and not the problems will be ready for service. With eyes on the circumstances, you may miss God's perfect timing. You see, salahs are not always easy to accept, not always easy to deal with, but it's all music if he is the leader. What if a stethoscope is put to your heart while under suffering? Will you remain as calm as David? Both the Old Testament and the New Testament provide an answer to that question. Isaiah 26 and 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusted in thee. Paul, writing to the Philippians 4 and 7, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. As I close, I'd like to encourage you to enjoy your salah. You ask me, brother, how is it possible to enjoy my salah? How is it possible to enjoy suffering? You see, the word salah implies a modulation. That means a change of key, from a lower key to a higher key, from a minor key to a major key. Even in today's music, with its classical music, or gospel music, or pop music. A change usually happens during the playing of the instrument, the interlude, the bridge, when the singers are quiet. It prepares the singers for something higher, for something more positive, for a higher, for a major key. You see, that's exactly where Psalm number three starts. It starts in the minor key. It starts in the low note. But David had been given three salads. And after each one, David grew in confidence. He's lifted higher. He's having his circumstances change for the better. So that in the end, a fearless and confident David, as he's taken higher and higher, is given a final salah. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Salah. With every salah in our lives, we are prepared for something higher for something better, for something greater, for heaven itself. I'll close with a story. During the Great Depression, a man lost his job. He exhausted all his savings. He lost his house. His grief became nearly unbearable with the sudden death of his wife. The only thing that he had left was his faith. And even that was weakening. One day as he was looking for work, he stopped to watch men doing stonework on a church building. One of the builders was skillfully chiseling a triangular piece of rock. Not seeing the spot for this rock, this man asked the builder, where are you going to put that rock? The man pointed toward the top of the building. He said, do you see that little opening near the spire, right at the top? That's where it goes. I'm shaping it down here so it will fit up there. Tears filled the man's eyes as he walked away, whispering to himself, shaping it down here so it will fit up there. My brother and sister, that is exactly what God is doing for you as well. And he does it through suffering. He is shaping you down here so that we will fit up there. May the Lord bless his word. Amen.
Thank you, Brother Marius, for a word of encouragement this evening. Now, we're going to sing a closing hymn, after which we'll ask Winton if you would close the meeting in a word of prayer, after we sing a closing hymn. Jesus, keep me near the cross, there a precious fountain, free to all a living stream, falls from Calvary's mountain, in the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever. Till my rising soul shall fly, rest beyond the river. In the cross, a trembling soul, love and mercy found me. There the bright and morning star shed its beams around me. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever. Till my raptured soul shall fly. Beyond the river, near the cross, O Lamb of God, bring it sins before me. Help me walk from day to day with the shadows on me. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the grave. Near the cross, I watch and Trusting ever till I reach the golden strand, just beyond the river. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever till my Thank you, Winton. What's happened to Winton? Oh, God. Okay. Brother Tony, will you give th uh, just closing the word of prayer, please? Uh, oh, eternal God, our oh, Heavenly Father, what a joy it is for us to be able to come into thy very presence, all because of thy glorious Son, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who, having purged our sins, Having made purification of sins, he sat himself down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, and that he ever lives to make intercession for us. We thank you that he's a great high priest, an empathetic, a sympathetic high priest, one who was touched with the feelings of our infirmities, our testings, our trials, our fears, our, fear, our, our, our faithlessness, whatever it might be, tested in all points like as we are, sin apart. We worship thee and praise thee for uh, thy, our, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who means so much to us as thy people. Father, we thank thee for our coming together this uh, evening, and thank you for those who uh, have this desire to 
just to share these moments in thy presence and thank you for the reading of the scriptures to be reminded that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and that it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, the people of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We thank thee for thy word. We thank thee for the uh, practical lessons we're able to uh, receive from thy holy word of truth, even with regards to the experience of David, the man of God, the man after God's own heart, who passed through those different human life, ex real life experiences, and yet was able to uh, express his absolute faith and trust in thee, the true and the living God. Uh, so, Father, we just give thee thanks for thy word and pray thy blessing upon thy people, both young and old, wherever we might, we might be across the globe. We thank thee for every lampstand testimony raised up to thy name across the world, and to know that we are gathered in and unto the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the one who said, that we're two or three, having been gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So we give thee thanks for our coming together. We ask thy help upon thy people. We think of this, the, um, the frail and the feeble. We think of the aged and the infirmed. We think of the sick and the suffering. We think of the tested and the tried. We think of the sad and the bereaved. Whatever the circumstances, we know we can turn to thee at all times. Thou art the God who is more than enough to meet our every need. And thou hast met our need this, today as we open thy word, as we listen to the exposition thereof. Receive our thanks and part us with thy blessing in the worthy name of our soon returning Saviour and Sovereign, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Tony. Uh, just one or two announcements. We, um, next Wednesday, God willing, our Brother Jim Goatley will share a word with us. We're looking to the Lord to give him help on that occasion. Also, remember the meeting on the Lord's Day. And uh, another brother, Norman, will be back with us. He hasn't been there for a while. We've been missing him. So our brother Norman will share with us on the Lord's Day. Also remember the Young People's Bible Study um, on Friday night at 7.30. So thank you all for joining. And the meeting ID stays the same. Um, so if you'd like to share that, brother Jim, with the believers down in Balclutha, you're very welcome to. The number doesn't change, but I'm going to unmute everybody so that you can speak to um, Brother Marius. Thank you. Thank you, Marius. <coughs> it was good to be with you again. Thank you. Great, great message. Thank you, Marius. We enjoy those thoughts very much. Okay. I. Uh, can see you are a musician at heart. <laughs> you gave us some um, musical notes from that lovely song. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have to call you musical Marius Minar. Thank you very much. <laughs> lovely. Good, good to see you, Uncle Tony. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, nice, nice to see Mr. Goatley. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll tell you a little secret. It was Marius's birthday uh, two days ago. And it oh, was wow, brother, wow. brother Tony's birthday as well. So uh, we, we wish to... Oh. <laughs> happy, happy birthday, birthday brother. Okay. Uh, happy birthday, everybody. Marius, let the sing it for us. Marius, let the Eddie to sing it for us. Good to see you, brother Jim, down from the deep south. Looking... Yeah. Looking forward to hearing you next week. Yeah. I can't hear you. Are oh, you sound mute, Jim? Uh, um, yeah, there we go. Can you hear me now? There we go. Oh. There we go. Yeah. Yes, uh, Simeon, my uh, intended message and the will of the Lord next week will be the meaning and power of the cross. Lovely. Mm. We'll, we'll advertise that. The meaning and the power of the cross. Thank you, Brother Jim. Yes, so that's uh, what's on my mind for, for next week. And I'll, and I'll have a PowerPoint. So um, let's uh, look forward to that prayerfully and um, 
hope that we can have an um, encouraging time if we're still here. Yeah. The Lord yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. How are you I doing, Audrey? Snow in Cape Town, Uncle Tony? <laughs> uh, it's, 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 it's warm this morning. We've had two uh, warmish days, but there's more rain expected in the next two days. I see on the so motorway. We're having, our winter, we're having our winter rainfall now, which is good. Uh, we haven't had much rain during the month of May, but we're having quite a bit of rain uh, um, now this month, in the month of June. Yeah. We need it. <laughs> we need it. <laughs> oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Our, dams are no, our dams are not all that full uh, across, the, uh, across South Africa. So they are waiting for some good rains to fall, but at least here in the Western Cape where we are, and those of you who are South African, you'll know what I mean by the Western Cape. Uh, we are <laughs> delighted to know <laughs> that our rainfall is uh, looking good. Thank okay. the Lord. Yeah. Yes. He makes his rain to fall yes. upon the good and the bad, and his, and his sun to shine upon the just and the unjust. That's our God. <laughs> yeah. Are you having any locusts uh, down there, Tony? Any? Any locust? The plague of locust? Uh, no, no, it no. We don't have be, them down here. It's further north, is it? And and uh, goes, uh, I, the, yes, I think you're right. Yes, yes. yes. The, the, the media is saying that there's quite a um, a number of the African countries are being uh, hassled with locusts. Oh yes, there's much. That's much. That's further north in 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 in, in, in the continent of Africa. Yeah. Okay. I think I think it's Ethiopia. Yes, they have. Um, yeah, and, and Kenya as well, I believe. Kenya as well, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. We yeah, no, we don't. We don't in the in the in the in the, in the deep south of the continent. <laughs> <laughs> We've got water restrictions uh, in Auckland. <laughs> We've got the drought going on here. Oh. <laughs> so we right. <laughs> I I see your 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 prime minister made an announcement that uh, they're going to be lifting all the uh, the, the balance of the restrictions. Is that right? We're in level one, which is that correct, Morris? Yes, level one. We're in level one, all the just the borders. Okay, the borders. But now, I, I, but now I, see, I see on the news you've had two new cases of infection. Yeah, no, foreigners. Foreigners. <laughs> <laughs> I think it came from the UK. <laughs> it came from the UK. Uh, <laughs> yeah, UK. Yeah. Yeah. So, are, are you are, are you are your meetings opened already? I know in some cases they are, like with Marius. I know you opened already some while ago. Yes. Uh, yes. Three weeks now. Yeah. Three weeks. Okay. Yeah. No, we haven't opened yet because um, although we are allowed to have. Uh, 50 people in the gathering, the, the, um, the restrictions, the conditions which have to be uh, complied with are so, uh, so burdensome um, that we felt it wise just to hold, hold off a little bit longer until these burdensome restrictions are kind of lifted more mm. to enable us to gather mm. freely without having to comply with so many rules and regulations. Makes sense. Uh, and mm. that's why we decided just to hold off a bit, of while, a bit longer. Yeah. But we do have the like you have the Zoom uh, get together, the digital platform. We use yeah. that on on the Sunday morning and, and on, on a Wednesday evening. Yeah. Good. Anyway, I have to leave now. But <laughs> thank you for the opportunity again, and it was good to be with you. Yeah. Looking Thanks, forward Marius. to you all next week, brother Jim. Praying yeah. for you. Yes. Thank you, Marius. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Love to you, bit. Okay. Yeah. I'll say goodbye as well. Right. Thank yeah. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. All. Bye. Bye. We'll in the meeting here, we'll see you, God willing. Well, for those that at Takapuna Sunday, and um, yeah, everybody yeah, else next Sunday. God bless. Thanks, man. All right, all the best. God bless. Okay. Good night. Good night. Bye, bye, Robert. Good night. Bye, bye.